I just, I just came. <laughs> but this morning, I want to talk about that. Uh, not so. I mean, it was, it was kind of interesting that this happened exactly the week of my sermon on what it means to love your neighbor as yourself. <laughs> Isn't that ironic how it happened? Um, so, but just to let you know that uh, the, the town board did not agree at all with the, the planning commission. And the town board is, seems positive toward rezoning. And so we have some things that we have to do, some homework we have to do, some footwork we have to do, going to the neighborhoods and talking to people. And we're going to do those things. Uh, so it's not, it's not all bad. It was just, it was, it was weird to me. <laughs> Did you feel it was weird? I, I was totally unprepared. But we, we've been looking at what it means to live the new life in Christ. What does it mean to live the new life in Christ? What is a Christian supposed to look like? And so we've been looking at 1 John 2, 3 through 6, and uh, we talked about that uh, two weeks ago. Uh, we showed that we know God by keep his, keeping his commandments. In 1 John 2, 3 through 6, he says, Now by this we know that we know God, him, God, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know God, him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Right? So if you're going to claim to be a Christian, you ought to make a serious effort to living like Jesus Christ. Walking like Jesus Christ. <clears throat> obeying God's commands. That's something we should do. Now, uh, can you claim to be a Christian and not do that? Mm -hmm. Have you ever known anybody who's done that? Okay. And what does it look like? It's it's embarrassing Messy. for the for the kingdom of God. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing to us to uh, to see that and, and uh, to try to be a godly person next to an uh, claiming to be a Christian next to an ungodly person who's claiming to be a Christian. Kind of ruins our testimony. So the observation I wanted to make with that was that we need to understand that living the new life in Christ is rooted in following the commandments of God. You can't separate that. I know the, the modern religious uh, tone for many people is that it's, it's not about the commandments of God, it's about a relationship with God. And certainly it is about a relationship with God, but you can't separate it from the commandments of God because the only way we can have a relationship with God is when we are following the commands of God, according to this, right? You all see that, right? So 1 John 2.7 goes forward and, and expresses this idea. Brethren, I write no new commandment to you, but an old commandment which you have had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word which you heard from the beginning. Uh, what is that word? What is the commandment? What is, without Garrett, did you put it up there? I talked about it two weeks ago, right? It's from Luke 10, 25 to 37. This is a different passage. It says basically the same thing as we looked at last time, but it's Luke 10, 25 through 37. It says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested Jesus, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. So two weeks ago I talked about what it means to love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right? Uh, this week, the love your neighbor as yourself command comes from Leviticus chapter 19. Garrett's going to put that up there. Leviticus chapter 19, verses 17 through 18. This is where this command comes from. It says, you shall not hate your brother. Does that anybody stumble at that? Mm -hmm. You shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor, that's confrontation, and not bear sin because of them. Uh, bears a strong resemblance to Ephesians 4, uh, 26 and 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. <coughs> you shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. So it's interesting that in this context of loving your neighbors as yourself, it's in the context of conflict. <coughs> 
Interesting. Anybody ever have conf conflict? <laughs> Anybody have conflict on the way to church? This is not don't raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> So Jesus is, this, this guy is actually quoting from the Old Testament. And Jesus has said this other, in other places. And th these are the two, old, the old commandments. They sum up the whole law. These two commands sum up the whole law. But then in verse 29, we have the, the, the situation where uh, the guy wanted to justify himself. You know, that's one of the, it's one of the most challenging things to do in a conflict where you're being confronted is to justify yourself, right? Am I right? Do we struggle with that? We want to justify. We want to explain why we did what we did. Why we believe what we believe. Why we do what we do. To justify ourselves. And this guy had this. Now, I'm going to kind of do this as, an, as a uh, VBS story. Are you guys ready for this? this these, these kids. The, the kids had the VBS. Al was, he was like, why don't you preach like that, Pastor? So I'm going to do this story. All right, so there was a man... He was a Jewish man, and he was taking a trip. So he, he packs all this stuff. You know, he's got his toothbrush and his toothpaste and his change of clothes. And he was going to take a trip to Jericho. Now, <coughs> Jerusalem is up way high on a mountain. Jericho is down, down by the plain, by the Jordan River. So you have to walk down, 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 down the, the mountain paths, uh, up and over. And it's a it's a it's, I'm, I'm tired already just talking about it, right? So we're, he's going up and down, and then he comes and he comes in, into this one little narrow spot. He's walking through this narrow spot, and it's kind of creepy, and you know, he's looking around, trying to spot people. And then all of a sudden, somebody jumps out in front of him. Big guy. You know, have you ever seen The Princess Bride? Yes. We are three wandering travelers, right? <laughs> so they, they jump out, and he says... And they say, is there a city, city nearby? And he says, uh, no, there's no city nearby. And so they, good, there, there's nobody to hear you scream. So they start pounding on him and wailing on him. They take his money and his, 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 his uh, luggage and, and leave him beaten and bleeding and struggling and feeling like he was going to die on the side of the road. And if you, have you ever been really, really sick? I mean, really, really sick. So uh, a while back, and I talked about this before, I... That we had the influenza virus in our house, and so uh, uh, we had two bathrooms, one in the front and one in the back. And Seth was in the front. My son Seth was in the front, and he was he was not good things. <laughs> and everybody's like, "Oh Seth, oh Seth, how are you doing?" I'm in the back bathroom where nobody's there, and I'm laying on the floor, wondering if somebody's going to come in and find me before I die here. <laughs> It's funny now. It was not funny then. And that's kind of, I imagine, what that guy was feeling, wondering who, who is going to stop. Eyes beaten so bad that he can't open them. He can hear fine, but he can't see. And laying on the side of the road, and, and the sun is shining on him, beating down, and he's getting thirstier and thirstier. And as he's standing there, as standing there, as he's laying there on the ground, he hears somebody walk by. And he hears the, the little the jingle on, on his... Uh, the tassels on his robe as he's walking. And guess who he is? He's a priest. You know, priests wear these jiggly things, I guess. <laughs> so there, the priest sees him, and it's not a it's not a wide distance. I mean, it's not a huge gap there, but it's enough where he can get around him. And the priest, for whatever reason, there's been a lot of speculation as to why a priest would do this, but he went around and he kept going on his way. He was a Jewish man. I've been reading a lot of stories uh, in the uh, uh, during the Holocaust in, in the German Nazi occupation of, uh, of Holland and Albania, and uh, how easy it was for the Nazis to identify Jews by the way they look. They, you, people who know Jewish people know what they look like, and so this priest had to have known that this man was a Jew. There was no way of confusing them. They had different clothes. Uh, different facial structure, different whatever, but he knew, and yet he went around. And then a little while later, another guy comes, and he's, he's a scribe, and he's, I don't know, reading out of his tablet as he's walking, <laughs> and reading and reading, and he sees this guy, and oh, I better get out of here fast, and he goes around and he leaves him. Jesus is telling this story, right? He's telling this story to, to give an illustration. 
the, the person that's on the ground, who is that person? That's the person who needs something. He needs someone to be neighbor to him, right? And in this story, I think Jesus is playing with the crowd here because uh, who is my neighbor? I'm the one who has, and my neighbor is the one who needs, right? In the, in the mind of the, the Pharisees. So if he's the one who has, and the person he's helping is the neighbor, the one he, who has need, then in the story, the Jewish man is who? The person who's in need, right? So then the... Uh, <laughs> Jesus throws this curveball at him. You've been watching a lot of baseball lately, right? Yeah. Jesus throws this curveball. When I was playing baseball as a little kid, um, uh, I never really learned how to bat. And so by the time I got into the little leagues, uh, all I could really swing at was a fastball. Well, there was one pitcher one time who figured out that I wouldn't stand at a curveball thrown in my head. So it was no problem. He threw the curveball. And it was coming at my head, so I drop. And then it would, before it would get, get to me, it would go over the plate and get a strike. So Jesus knows these people. He knows their weakness. So he throws them this curveball. He said, there's a Samaritan. Dogs. Dogs. <laughs> Samaritan aren't worth the, the ground they walk on. Just terrible people. And they called them that, dogs. So uh, the Samaritan... <clears throat> He's, he's a guy, and, and, you know, sometimes Samaritans had to have business with the Jews, and he was on the same road. And he was on a trip going somewhere, and all of a sudden he came upon the person lying on the ground. That guy on the ground, in any other situation, might have hated him. That guy on the ground may, may have thrown stones at him, or spit at him, or said mean things about him. Cat calls as he walked by. Wouldn't have given him the time of day, most likely. And yet when that, that Samaritan saw that man, he looked down, and what does it say? In verse 33, he had compassion on him. He cared about his situation, his problems, his life at that moment. And so what did he do in verse 34? He went to him and he bandaged his wounds. He picked him up gently and, and, and cleaned him off and, and with water, poured water over his head and his face and gave him water to drink. Right? And, and, then, and then picked him up and put him on his donkey and brought him to an inn and took care of him there. Overnight, on the next day, it says, when he departed, he took out two denarii, two days' wages, and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So who was the one who was helping? The Samaritan. And who was he being a neighbor to? The Jewish man who was beaten. So in verse 36, Jesus nails him. Just pow, right in the head. Right you ever get sermons preached at you like that where you just pow, right in the kisser? And you're just like, oh, I can't stand this. So he hits him, square in the heart. He says in verse 36, So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? The Pharisee, the scribe, or the Samaritan? I think in the Jewish the Jewish thought was that he needed to be he neighbor to the Samaritan at, at you know at the most gracious and compassionate is that he needed to be neighbor to the Samaritan because the Samaritan was the one in need in, in, in the Jewish mindset the lowly dog <coughs> scum of the earth person obviously they're the one who needs help well Jesus turned it around and made the Jew the one who needed the help. And the Samaritan the one who was neighbor to him. So he says uh, in verse 37, He who showed mercy on him, then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So the commands from the Old Testament to love God and our neighbor are still in effect today. We don't, we don't stop loving our neighbor. We live the new life in Christ by loving God and our neighbor, right? Uh, you know what our purpose is at New Life Bible Church? Can you say it? We love God. God. We love neighbor. our neighbor. Oh, come on. Where is it? Is it, in the it should be on the back of the bulletin. Loving God. On the very back. We love God. We love our neighbor. Very back. 
Should we? Oh, it's in the front. It's in the front? Oh, let's take all the Christ who walk in the newness of life by loving God, loving our neighbor, and loving his children. Okay. How many of you have ever read that? <laughs> it's in the bulletin, right? It must be true if it's in the bulletin. It's like the internet. If it's in the bulletin, it must be true. So, walking in the new life in Christ means we love God and we love our neighbor. What does it mean to love our neighbor? Well, I've got a slew of things, and we're just going to kind of go through this. In your bulletin, also, this is a full bulletin this week. You're very honored this week to have, <laughs> what, three, four inserts? There's one, uh, this is loving God and loving your neighbor, okay? Look at the loving God, loving your neighbor insert, and uh, we're going to go through some of those pretty quickly. So it says, love your neighbor in your relationships. Be honest with people around you. Uh, Leviticus 19, 11 through 12. You don't have to put these up there. Zechariah 8, 16. Talk about how important it is for us to be honest with people. Um, uphold the standards of truth, justice, and peace with the people who come into your home, business, or church, regardless of race, gender, or religion. Do you think this applies to the situation on the road? on the road to, Jer to Jericho, right? So was the Samaritan man loving his neighbor? Yes, because he was upholding the standards of truth, justice, and peace, regardless of race, gender, or religion. Loving his neighbor. Uh, judging people fairly regardless of their status or wealth, again, part of the story. Trying to be friendly. <clears throat> loving your neighbor. Always being faithful and being connected enough with people to so there can be a mutual sharing of needs. And then, uh, one of our uh, most uh, knee-jerk reactions when we're being confronted is to defend ourselves and not listen. But loving our neighbor means that I give serious thought to what I say and then say it at the appropriate time and in the kindest manner. When I'm the one who's doing the confronting, when I'm the one who's doing the talking, I, try, I need to try to choose the most appropriate time and say it in the kindest manner. Do you ever blow it? <laughs> say it when you shouldn't? At the wrong time? <clears throat> Volcano erupts. Yeah. And then, I also need to, at the same time, always be ready to listen to the truth spoken to me. You know, I'm, I'm the one dishing it out. I need to be ready to hear what somebody else has to say about what I'm doing. Love your neighbor with your possessions. Uh, pay the people who work for you what you agreed to pay them, when you agreed to pay them, and don't expect people to do work for you for nothing. Uh, is that a problem in the world today? Absolutely, it is. What about in this situation with the, the uh, uh, Samaritan paying the shopkeeper before he left? He's paying him what he agreed to pay him, and he will pay him when he gets back. He will do that because he loves his neighbor. When someone asks to borrow something you have, you should give them what they need if you have it, right? And that's what the Samaritan, the Samaritan the, I'm sure the Jew didn't ask him to borrow, lend um, money to him, but he, he, borrowed, he gave it to him because he was in need. Uh, don't be surety for a cosign. Don't be surety for or cosign for people because they need to, one, learn to respect what you have, and two, learn the value, hard work, and money for, of uh, hard work and money for themselves. Have you ever co-signed for anybody and paid the price for it? Uh, it can be an ugly thing because what it is, this uh, I think I can say it right, is co-signing for a loan is you giving money you can't afford to lose to someone who doesn't have what they need to get what they want when they want it. No, that's not how it goes. I can't remember. Is that, is that yeah. work for you, Tom? Yeah. That's good. Oh, that they can't, to get something they can't afford to have. That's what it is. It's you giving money you can't afford to lose for someone to get something they can't afford to have. And in many instances, that's the case. So uh, you may disagree. And this is one of those sticking points where I have people disagree with me. But that's okay. Uh, that's what it says in Proverbs 6, 1 through 3 and 17, 18. Don't covet what people have or be quick to sue them in material disagreements. Loving your neighbor who is in adversity. Now, obviously, this applies to the story here. Make a conscious effort to relieve the suffering of the poor by showing mercy through addressing their physical needs. 
Do you think Meals on Wheels applies in that instance? Yes. Do you, do you feel like we should give up Meals on Wheels? No. 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 I mean, it's not something we're paying for. We're just letting them use our building. And they're even giving us a little money to do it. Don't hate the poor by ignoring their plight or disrespecting the poor by favoring the wealthy. Treat people with disabilities with respect and compassion. Show kindness to the afflicted and pray for the suffering. And then loving your neighbor in conflict. Don't go public with a private dispute. Oh, that's, that's one of my tough ones. You ever talk about people when you're upset with them? You ever? Please, tell me you don't. No, never. No. Okay. I'm the only one. Properly deal with offenses so you're able to love your neighbor as yourself. And of course, the releasing of the offenses through the prayer of release is something we teach here in our Bible church uh, that helps. Uh, don't attack people by talking behind their back. Bear false witness by saying things that are exaggerated or not true about them. Taunt them or use flattery or lie to hide your true feelings toward them. Uh, actually, in, in thinking about having talking about what happened at that meeting, uh, I didn't. Want, I wanted to test my heart to see if I was going to do any of those things to the <laughs> to the planning committee. Uh, in talking about it, do, you, do you feel, anybody feel like I did? Marty says no. He was there. They're not. They're not evil people. Terrible people. They just. They have a different worldview, and. You have to respect their worldview. They're they're in government. They they have the, the beliefs that they have, uh, but that doesn't mean we can sacrifice our worldview to make them happy. Amen. That's right. Don't harm someone by plotting evil plans or doing evil deeds. We're not going to go bomb the Randall Township <laughs> building. I'm serious. I don't want anybody. <laughs> So, what does it mean to love your neighbor? If you look at the story, what, what I've done here is I've gone through the Old Testament and picked out things that, that were clearly identified as things we needed to do to love our neighbor. So, the, the Old Testament has gobs, and, and probably much more that I have picked out here, of how we need to be loving to our neighbor. How we need to love our neighbor as ourself. And so as we as a church are living the new life in Christ, we need to be about loving our neighbor. We need to be... Care, we need to care about the poor, the needy. We don't, we don't uh, give the, the wealthy preference. We, we reach out and we have an impact in their lives. We, we touch them where they, where they need, you know, whether it's food or lodging or, or whatever. I mean, honestly, is there a lot of, are there a lot of homeless people in Twin Lakes? Not that I'm aware of. Is, are, is there a huge need for a soup kitchen in Twin Lakes? Probably not. Or in Randall Township? Probably not. It's probably never something we would ever have the opportunity to do because, just because of the nature of where we live. But whatever that looks like, we need to be ready to step in and care for people, whether it's in a nat natural disaster, where there's a tornado and people need a place to stay, or if they need food or water, we need to be there and love our neighbor in a real tangible way. The Old Testament defines what it means to love our neighbor as ourselves in our relationships, with our possessions, in adversity, and in conflict. <coughs> and the question then becomes, do you love your neighbor? Are you loving your neighbor? Or are there things on this list that you would not do? I, I wouldn't do that. If there are things on the list that you don't feel comfortable doing or don't feel like you could do, then guess what? That's an area in your life where you need to grow, where I need to grow in becoming more like Christ, more like God, because as it says in the beginning, he who says he abides in God ought himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. And guess who Jesus spent his time with? Not the people the government was looking to, to be around. He wasn't spending all of that this time with the, the rich and the, the, the powerful he avoided those people. Who did he spend time with? The poor, the weak, the sick, the sinner. Because Jesus didn't come to heal those who are well. He, he came to heal those who are sick. And that's, that's the people we need to love. As our, I mean, we need to love the rich as well as the poor. But we can't allow ourselves to be corralled 
into loving the way that the world says we ought to love. So ask yourself, look at that list, go through there and see if there's any place where you're not loving your neighbor and ask God to work in your heart to bring change and conviction. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and for the opportunity that we've had to look at your word. I thank you for the truth of it and pray that you would encourage us with that truth, that you would touch our hearts and our lives, Lord, that we wouldn't walk away uh, unchanged or untouched by your word. I pray that you would challenge us and help us to grow in <coughs> loving our neighbor as ourselves. And Lord, I pray that we would stay firm and faithful on that, regardless of the consequence or the cost to what we would hope we could do, whether it's moving to Randall or any other way, Lord, that we will not give up our purpose, our mission, to follow you for the sake of getting uh, worldly possessions and worldly comforts. We love you, God, and we want to be faithful to you to the end. Pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Why don't you stand with us? <laughs>